everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and one of the most popular products I've reviewed on my channel is this D-Link 5020L. It's a wireless security camera that has uh, pan and tilt capabilities, and one of the things it doesn't do is record video itself. It required uh, the video imagery to be sent to another device, like a PC or a tablet, uh, or maybe an FTP site or an email, but it didn't really have any storage capacity. And one of the things that D-Link has come up with is a very inexpensive way to add, essentially, a DVR capability to your D-Link security camera network, and that's through this device called the 202L, and it is a uh, bring your own storage device. So basically it's a, a, a little thing that will look for the video on your network and it will then uh, pass that video to an external hard drive or a USB stick or something like that. It has two USB ports on board and you can switch between uh, the two. So right now uh, the hard drive, because this is blinking, is the one that's recording, but I could uh, sometimes push this button here and it'll switch over to the other one. However, I've, I've been having trouble trying to figure out exactly how to get this switch to work. It's not very elegant and the switch back doesn't work all that well. And the reason why you'd want to switch is that if you uh, were running a hard drive, you wanted to take it off and look at it, uh, you could switch to the other device so you don't lose any recording while you're going. It has an Ethernet cable here because it needs to be hardwired into your network, so it cannot uh, work over Wi-Fi unless you have some other uh, you know, Ethernet to Wi-Fi adapter that you can plug into. Uh, and uh, that's pretty much it for the hardware side. It, it doesn't uh, have much uh, functionality on board, except, of course, uh, there is a button here that you can push to uh, find the cameras on the network automatically. Now, it only works with a few of the D-Link cameras uh, that support the MyD-Link protocol. So this 5020L does, and there's a few others that do as well. Um, but there aren't uh, many yet that uh, work with it. So you may want to check your cameras that you have already to make sure it's compatible. And of course, if you're buying new cameras, to take a look and make sure that uh, what you're buying is going to work with this if that's your intent. So let's take a look at the software next because uh, it has a, a lot of uh, functionality and it's a little flaky too. Now the software installation wasn't too difficult. There's an installer that you have to download from D-Link's website, either for Windows or for the Mac. I did find on the Mac that uh, the installation application is not signed by Apple as an official developer, so it's going to give you an error, security error, before you load it. So you have to go into uh, the Apple security settings and allow that application to be run. But once you do get it installed, it finds this automatically on the network and makes installation very easy. In fact, the, uh, the device finds all the cameras automatically, and it's pretty simple to get uh, everything set up and up and running. Now, uh, the software itself runs in a web browser, so uh, when you're in there, you uh, basically connect to the, uh, the camera's IP address. And what I found is that it doesn't work with the Mac because it requires uh, Java and ActiveX. So for, for whatever reason on the Mac, even though it has Java, the, one, uh, the Safari that I'm running, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. So I, was ha I have to go into uh, Windows in order to get that up and running. But when you are in there, you can uh, select your camera. You see there's an uh, option for four others. And I'm just going to turn the sound off here so we don't echo back. Uh, there's, uh, it picks up the audio and the video. And I'm controlling uh, my D-Link camera now through the DVR uh, to the camera. So it's got uh, all those pan and tilt features as well, which is pretty neat. Now, what you'll see if I go to the status screen here is it'll show me that uh, what cameras I have connected and whether or not they're recording. So right now I'm uh, receiving uh, about 2.4 megabytes per second, I believe, on uh, my network here. I'm recording at 30 frames per second. It has the camera that I'm using, uh, and it looks like things are in good shape there. So that's pretty handy to see. Uh, if I go back to the live video screen for a second here, you can see a little bit more. Let me scroll down a little bit here. And uh, what this shows me here is uh, which uh, device is currently recording. So right now our Seagate drive, the hard drive is recording. I can try to switch it to the other one. I haven't figured out again how to do that uh, very smoothly. So, um, but you can switch to the other recorder and begin recording on that device as well. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let me zoom out here. We'll go over to the playback screen. Now this is cool because I, I've been, um, I've used other very more, much more expensive systems and uh, this actually comes close to it. Now what I found though is that I couldn't get this to work right on Windows 7. It is working on this old Windows XP installation I have. So I'm not sure if I have to uh, tweak more security settings or something. And this is where that ActiveX uh, component comes in. So what you see here is a, a detail of all the recordings that I have available to me through the DVR. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And you can see some of these events that I have set up here. So Basically, what happens is it records everything. Unless you tell it not to, it will record absolutely everything, which is fine because what will happen is, is it will uh, wipe out the drive or uh, basically recycle the drive as it goes. So if it fills the drive up, it will begin deleting the oldest video files and continuing onward. And depending on how big your hard drive is and how much video you're putting on it, you could probably store quite a bit. They have a guide on the box. Um, it says that uh, if you're at 640 by 480, which is what this camera will store, 
um, you can store uh, seven days of data of recordings uh, in 18 gigabytes. And uh, if you want to do 30 days, it's about 78 gigabytes. And I, I don't know if that, if, I think that might be uh, settings for maybe a little bit slower bit rate or something because I'm seeing much larger recordings than what I'm recording at currently. But I think you can tweak it and really figure out what you really need to have on there and, and, and work the math on it. Now, the, uh, the recordings, basically, the red areas are things that were recorded. The blue areas are when the camera detected an event. So what happens is, is that the camera uh, settings for event detection still need to be set up. And if you go to my review of the 5020L, I'll show you how to do that on this camera. So basically, when this thing sees an event, it shoots a little signal to the DVR here to say that, hey, I had a motion event, mark it. And when it does mark it, I get a little blue uh, icon here, and I can go in and see that my dog had walked in front of the camera uh, during that period of time. So. Uh, pretty cool in that you can kind of very quickly uh, scroll through what you're looking for. You can also select a range. So let's say I wanted to see what happened right in here. I can do that, uh, click OK, and it will then uh, pull up my playback window with exactly that uh, stream of video. So uh, pretty neat. And I, and, I, and I found, like I said, this is very similar to some more expensive systems that I've used. And uh, you know, for a very inexpensive setup, you know, I think right now we're probably maybe just around $200 or so maybe a little bit over $200 with the camera, the hard drive, and the DVR. Uh, can't beat the price on that for sure. It's kind of a roll your own solution. Um, the, again, the issue though is that this doesn't work on the Mac for some reason, and I had some issues with Windows 7 as well. Let's step through the setup real quick so you can see uh, some of the things that it has. Um, you can add a camera through this interface here. It'll actually go out and search my network to see if any other cameras have shown up. I only have one, um, so I can't do uh, more than that. Uh, you can also set what kind of video recording formats you want to do. And for, for instance, we can set the frame rate lower uh, and maybe save a little disk space. We can also uh, record at a smaller resolution, and I can also tweak the bit rate as well. Um, I like to keep the audio on too because that's pretty handy because if you're looking to uh, capture somebody doing something they shouldn't, you want to be able to hear their voices if you can't see their face perhaps. Uh, and then I also had set up, uh, again, channel 2 is the camera that I'm using right now, uh, the motion events to record as well because by default it doesn't do that. Even if the camera is recording motion events, you need to go in here, configure those motion events so that uh, it will do that. And you can also set a recording schedule. So if perhaps you, um, you, know, you didn't want to have it record all the time, if you only record at night or something like that, uh, you can set a schedule in which it will uh, do that. You can set your time zone, of course, over here and carry about your business. Now, maintenance. Um, there isn't much to do maintenance-wise. I did find that it, it just acts a little flaky and you may want to reboot it every once in a while. Uh, the buzzer you might want to turn off if you're not in a mission critical thing where the camera needs to be running all the time. Um, if you unplug something, the, and I'm not going to do it now, the buzzer is loud and it goes off and it doesn't stop. <laughs> so uh, you want to, at least until you fix the problem. Although I did find that I did fix the problem one time and the buzzer kept going until I restarted it. So, uh, so that was a bit of an issue there. Uh, the other option here is the auto plug and play. So if you um, have this set to on, it will continuously look for new cameras. Uh, you can do a system restart here as well. The one thing I noticed though is that it doesn't have an option to turn it off and, I, and I'm not sure how to turn it off properly without uh, destroying the, the recording because you know it's one of those things you learn from from birth on computers is that when things are writing or reading on the disk you don't turn off the computer. It's not, never a good never a good thing so uh, just keep those things in mind. Uh, last little option here is you have uh, the hard drive settings and you can uh, format the drive uh, that you have in there as well. So uh, it does need to be formatted for the D-Link device before it can be used. I think it must use, um, it does use a FAT, um, you know, Windows compatible FAT file system because you can take the drive out and plug it in. And that's the next thing I want to show you, uh, which is you can take the drive out and review the footage on your computer if you, do, if you don't want to go through the web interface. And again, that uh, software is available, but only for Windows to be able to plug the drive in. So, uh, you know, Mac users are going to be kind of left out in the cold again. So let's take a look at that. The software is called HDD Viewer, and it's downloadable from D-Link's website. And it's a little unintuitive at first because they don't give you much to go on here, but you do uh, figure it out eventually. You hit open record here and you go to this folder icon. And now what we're going to do is find my folder, my drive, and it's right here. So we're going to click over this AV data uh, directory there. And you'll see now that uh, the 26th is lit up because it recorded some data here. And uh, you see something very similar to what we saw on the web interface. So we'll just zoom in my screen a little bit here. And uh, we'll zoom this in a little bit. And uh, we can scroll over and see what happened during those periods of time. So I'll just hit that again. And 
you know, maybe I want to see, uh, again, this little section here. Let's just look at this one here. And this is all events because I've been down in the studio moving things around. My arms are moving. But you can see now it picked up uh, what it recorded there as well. So a uh, pretty handy way to be able to kind of take the hard drive off and uh, view, view it in a little bit more of an intuitive way, especially if you have uh, Windows 7 and you're, you're struggling to get that web thing to work properly because of the security settings and the ActiveX and all that. Uh, you can just go in and uh, download the software and be able to do that just by plugging the drive uh, into the machine there. So I can hit OK here and it will play back with sound uh, what it recorded during the course of that. Now, if you want to use your Android device, your iPad, or your iPhone with the DVR, you're going to have to use D-Link's cloud service. Now, if you don't want to use your mobile devices, you don't have to register with the cloud service. You can keep your network completely uh, safe and off the grid, so to speak. And I like that a lot because a lot of products require you to use you know, some outside party to uh, provide intermediate connections. So it's only required if you're going to use the mobile app. And if you're not going to use the mobile app, you can completely turn it off. Um, the mobile app is somewhat useful. As you can see here, I've got my uh, camera pulled up right now and I'm able to, if I had other cameras connected, I could uh, connect to all four at the same time. I do have the ability to uh, use some of the uh, pan and tilt controls as well. Um, and you can see here, you could support all four cameras like you would elsewhere. If I double tap on the camera here, I can just hit this. And again, it's a little unintuitive because you have to know to like tap on the bottom of the screen to get, or it's anywhere on the screen to get this uh, little icon to pop up. And if you click down here, uh, you'll see a, a little screen pop up. And what it'll do is it'll light up red any place it has recordings for that particular day. So um, if I go to the 17th here, um, or 17th hour, and I look at the minutes here, I could say, all right, let me look at what happened at, you know, at uh, 518, and I can hit play. And it should go out to the DVR and begin playing back what happened on that, uh, that period of time. It's not very fast, as you can see. So you know, using the computer locally or plugging that hard drive into your Windows machine is a lot uh, more efficient. But uh, you can go back in time if you need to in a pinch and see what's going on. I don't know if it supports the, uh, the event uh, thing like it does on the computer and on that application I showed you. So um, you know, this might just not be the best way to access things. But you can do it if you want to give a little access away to their uh, cloud service. And the other thing to note is that if you have the mobile app logged in, uh, you cannot play anything back on the computer. So you need to only, only allows one person in at a time. So what do I think? So I, I think it's good. I think it's going to get better. And I think its problems right now are mostly firmware and software related. So you know the, the quirkiness with the web interface, with the ActiveX control and the Java, they've got to work on that. They've got to make it better. When it does work, it works great. I was running this thing for several hours today. It was recording everything it was seeing and then uh, properly showing me the motion events from the camera. And I thought that was really slick. So I think this has a lot of potential. It's very inexpensive. I mean, you could really build your own security network uh, fairly uh, inexpensively. And I think this could actually uh, work quite well. They just really have to uh, work out some of those bugs in the software. This is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.